Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Scum Dogs Kennel. And yes, I did say I was going to do an earlier morning stream today, folks. So, uh, because I was uh, in the middle of the day, basically, now. <laughs> but hey, we're here and we're going to be looking at Aura Reigns, a beautiful female space captain from another world. I've talked about her before, folks. And I wanted to do another video on her because uh, she's come up recently in more videos. I talked about her. <laughs> Either way, folks, sit back and enjoy yourselves. We're having some fun tonight. So let me go to share screen and have a we'll look at artwork from me on upcoming graphic novel scum dogs and then we'll have some fun right that was me making sure i was streaming folks ah here we are let's go over here here's the extreme 90s cover from my graphic novel scum dogs i did this cover to the harking back to the comics of the 90s from image comics my book is a loving parody of 80s cartoons like transformers and gi joe a real american hero the stars of my book are your classic saturday morning cartoon villains the scum dogs trying to take over the universe they were once rich and famous athletes that competed in superhuman spring events in the far future see in the far future people can give up being human thanks to advancements in magic and science and become monsters to compete for fame and fortune and just cold hard cash in the scum dog sports. But the scum dogs were banned from those sporting events for being villains and idiots. And now they want to take over the universe. It's just a simple idea of getting my characters out there fighting the good guys or so-called good guys and basically parodying eighties cartoons. Now the scum dogs are led by death mug. Death mug is the purple guy with the metal mask over here. He's a parody of various villains from eighties cartoons. Have you noticed he has a skull for a face, much like skull master, who was the main villain of a uh, mighty max from the nineties cartoon. And he's purple. Well, well, like the shredder from teenage mutant Ninja turtles from the 87 cartoon, but I based his personality his I based death mugs personality on Carlton Banks. Carlton Banks was basically the butt monkey on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, an over-the-top arrogant prick of a character who was basically made fun of fun of in almost every episode because he was, well, over the top and basically very out there. I always thought if Carlton had superpowers, he'd be a supervillain. So basically I took Carlton, crossed him over with a Skull Master, and basically created Death Mug, who now wants to rule the universe. And if you think he's an insane maniac, let me tell you about his arch enemy, who's a parody of James T. Kirk, the captain of, captain of the Enterprise from Star Trek, Buick Starpoon. Buick Starpoon is a loving parody of characters like James T. Kirk or Buck, Ro Buck Rogers. You know, like Zap Brannigan from Futurama, Rama, those space captains who do daring do. But my guy is a complete and utter idiot. He's the leader of the Wild Rangers, who are basically his crew on his starship, and my parody of G.I. Joe. They fight the scum dogs. Now, Buick Starpoon is the leader of the Wild Rangers, and because they're G.I. Joe parodies, they each have a military specialty. They're special skills and abilities allow them to fight their enemies. That means, you know, the, you get the idea. Buick Starpoon's special skill is that, is that he's a captain in the Space Forces. And you'll know all of the Wild Rangers because they all wear a similar uniform to Buick Starpoon's green and white uniform. Over here, this guy with the Mohawk in the navy blue and white uniform, his name is Roadhog. His military specialty is that he's a soldier from the U.S. Army. He was transferred over to the Wild Rangers to fight the Scum Dogs. Then you have this bald guy down here with the gun and just the blue and white uniform. His name is Beach Pounder. His military specialty is that he's a Marine. Then you have the guy back here in the red uniform. His name is Blast Tank. His military specialty is that he's a tanker. Consider considering he's part of the crew of a starship, I'm sure basically driving around a tank is real useful in space. Either way, folks, this is my this is my cover for one of well, well this is one of three different variant covers. When my graphic novel is finished and when you can go and back it finally, you'll have a choice of three different covers. This is one of three. Now, Girl Friday, yeah, Girl Friday here is the female member of the Wild Rangers. She's the only competent person in my entire book. She knows Buick Starpoon, her boss, is an idiot. She knows Death Mug is an idiot. But unfortunately, she was assigned by her superior. To basically babysit and watch the Wild Rangers and make sure they fight the scum dogs and do their jobs. Either way, she hates them all. She hates them all. <laughs> now we have Death Mug's henchmen Murder Mouth and Sloppy. Murder Mouth is the blue guy with the top hat up here, and Sloppy is the pink guy down here with shape shifting powers. These guys are Death Mug's henchmen because all of these villains had henchmen who were total morons, and these guys are it. Then we have Hair Metal Doctor. Hair Metal Doctor is a mad scientist who's a hair metal musician. He was hired after the scum dogs became villains. It explains why he might be a scum dog, but he's not a monster. 
He's a parody of a character from G.I. Joe who is part of Cobra. Cobra's top ma- top scientist, Dr. Mindbender. Now, he inspired me to create Hair Metal Doctor because he dressed like he was a hair metal, like he was a hair metal musician. So I thought, why not create a villain who was a hair metal musician and a mad scientist? So I created him. Hair Metal Doctor. Then we have Miss Brusty Melons. Now, Miss Brusty Melons here is another parody of a character from G.I. Joe, the Baroness, who is Cobra's top spine infiltration agent. Now, the Baroness was an incredibly rich woman who became a terrorist to help Cobra take over the world. Miss Brusty Melons, in contrast, is just an incredibly rich woman who was bored with her life and dresses up in a female spice cat suit to make herself look like a sexy villainess and basically back and funds all of the scum dog's evil schemes just for fun. Yeah, she's only a villainess for fun. <laughs> Either way, she's an idiot like the rest of the characters, but she's going to be fun to read, read about when you bet when my book is finally up on Indiegogo for you to back. When scum dogs is finished, folks, go back it. It'll be a loving book. Now, please hit that like button for me. Make sure you're still subscribed. If you want to see this video again, use the link on the pinned tweet on my Twitter page at 777megachris1, and please share this video out. Now, folks, let's go over here and look at some Indiegogos before we do anything else, and look at some Aura Reigns. Hmm. Let me get this up here. Let's see this. Uh, by the way, folks, hit that like button for me. Hmm. Let me go over here real quick as well. Uh, let's see. refresh these pages. Yeah, it all do. Now let's go over here and look at some Indiegogos real quick. Uh, Ghost of the Badlands. Hmm. A masked fandom wanders the Arizona Badlands during the 1890s, distributing justice. GR05 Story 2 Gold Gravity. Hmm. Uh, on Teresa, Ghost meets his people's last survivors, where he's forced to make an uncertain future. Hmm. Interesting. Previously on... Okay, I'll start off with with uh, I'll start off with Cyber Frog Dark Harvest, I suppose. Hmm. Or to start off with, I think I'll start off with Bonds, the Cursed Child. All right, it's a werewolf book, folks. So let me get it up here if I if it will load. <laughs> okay, folks. As I said earlier, folks, I basically did a. I said it yesterday. I'd probably do a few morning streams because it's a weekend and I have some time. And stuff like that to do that. So I figured I'd do a few. Maybe I'll do another late stream tonight night for tomorrow's stream instead. Hmm. But either way, a few morning streams on the weekend aren't too bad, is it? Hmm. Ah, here we are. Bonds, the cursed child. A lone wolf carrying the burden of the moon brings chaos to the south border. It's made 9,819 9, and it's still funny in demand. And you can back this book, ETA, the featured perk, for $45. Exiled mini print by the full moon, mini print the moon goddess for 45 bucks. Now, what is this book about? Let's see. This little, yeah, here's the story of this book, folks. Lena's pleas have been heard along with her younger brother, Jesse. She begins training, but the siblings aren't the only werewolves at the training grounds. The South Border Pack becomes a home to a wolf who can either bring it to the peak of prosperity or the verge of destruction. Who is this new mysterious wolf, and will he have any impact on Lena's goal of becoming the future Alpha? Now, Puppy. Yeah, PDF Bonds the Cursed Child, PDF Bonds the Exiled. You can also get, well, the Teen. PDF, those are PDF Bonds the Drive, PDF Bonds the Cursed Child, and PDF, and PDF Bonds the Exiled for 12 bucks. Not too bad. Big Bad Wolf, Beck Bonds the Cursed Child, the print version of this book. Wolf Twins, hmm? get two get two copies of this book, one to basically keep pristine and one to basically read. And the Double Howl, $45. You get, basically, you can get Bonds, well, the first Bonds book, Volume 1, The Drive, as well as Bonds the Cursed Child for $45. That's pretty good, folks. Bonds the Cursed Child is a great-looking book with some great artwork. In fact, let's take a look at it real quick down here. See, look at this artwork. This is artwork comparable to anything, well, actually, better than anything coming out of the main two right now. Now, let's take, oh, I guess the, I guess the trailer's down for whatever reason. All right, that's Bonds the Cursed Child. Let's see, anything else? Yeah, still finding in demand. Previously on Clownfish TV, a webcomic collection. Let's take a look at this, folks. 
if it can load. Okay. Let's see. It's Clownfish TV, but it's a webcomic and on paper. Previously on, on Clownfish TV, a collection collects over 100 pages of brand new unseen comic strips by Jin, by Jin Wong based on loosely on the Clownfish TV, Clownfish Gaming YouTube channels. Mm. Mm, looks good. This campaign will be for a 6x9 graphic novel and also include additional perks like sticker prints and brand new limited edition enamel pins. Mm. Here's some of the webcomic. What February nineteenth, twenty twenty one? We have uh, her, the her basically doing that. Sorry, I yelled loudly. That's okay. I've got the limiter on. Oh, so it's it's on the geeky setting. Yeah, geeky sparkles there, and her husband. Yeah, you can tell. What? Wait, really? It's automatically limits when I yell. It does when the pitch gets too high. It does sometimes when you sound when you you sound like a like you're all robotic. It's because it's bringing the decibels down. An automatic geeky button. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The story so far. That's at least some of the comics you'll be reading in this collection, folks. Looks pretty good. Now, book and stickers for $35. This tier includes a copy of the book and a bonus sticker sheet. Shipped international backers need to pay additional postage. Okay, for $35, not too bad. There's also other perks as well. It sure looks good. This is a funny. This is just a funny book with some great comic strips, folks. From from Clownfish TV. It looks like a great looking book. Go back it. Hmm. We can take another moment here. Let's see. Uh, Thirty five dollars to back it. Book plus stickers plus pen. Fifty dollars. You get this tier includes a, the book, sticker sheet, and bub and bubbly Steve logo pen. Shipped. International backers need to pay additional postage. Too bad about that, but $50 for that is pretty good, even including a pen. Hmm. There are other perks are as well, and they all look pretty good. Now, folks, let's say we look at this for a while. Let's go look at this article now on Aura Reigns. Now, the article will be reading is Aura Reigns, a beautiful space woman from another world, allegedly. Let's take a look at it, folks. Although the UFO controversy began in the summer of 1947, it's a fact that encounters with alleged aliens in that era were all but non-existent. In fact, it wasn't until the early 1950s when people began to make claims to the effect that they had undergone face-to-face -face encounters with aliens. In nearly all of the cases, the aliens were very human-like. The only difference were that they sported heads of long blonde hair which, of course, was hardly the style for men in the early 1950s era USA. In that sense, they really stood out. But trim their hair, and they would look just like us. The extraterrestrials soon became known in the field of ufology as the Space Brothers. While, yeah, while those that encountered the, spa the beings from beyond were, were dubbed the contactees, unlike today's aliens, bug-like dwarfish black-eyed things with, who routinely abduct people in the dead of night and in trauma-filled fashion, the Space Brothers were friendly beings whose main role seemed to be warn, well, to warn people of the perils of nuclear weapons. Not only that, many of the contactees claimed that their brothers and sisters from the heavens above were Martians. As a consequence, beings from the Red Planet had been hurled, hauled into the growing UFO controversy. <coughs> very interesting let me go over here real quick folks uh, am i streaming on rumble hopefully i am and the thing oh we have one watching not too bad not too bad let me go over here all right one currently watching that's pretty good on there on there as well okay let's go back over here and get oh, sorry that i didn't forget to mute that there let's get back to this article now the contactees claim that they met the Space Brothers at isolated, lonely locales such as the deserts of California, New Mexico, and Arizona. Not only that, the Space Brothers urged those they targeted for recruitment to go out and spread the word and advice of the aliens. They certainly did that. In no time at all, the Space Brother contactee phenomenon became the dominating aspect of the early 1950s ufology. Without a doubt, the most famous many would soon, would soon say infamous and may still do of all the contactees was George Amsky. His claims of encounters with, with benign human-like entities captured the attention and imagination of the public to a major degree. For example, his first book, Flying Saucers Have Landed, which was co-written with Desmond Lisley, was a huge seller. Sells reached no less than six figures. Hmm. Sounds great, huh? doesn't it, folks? Following in the footsteps of Amsky's were Truman Bethram, who in 
1954 wrote aboard a flying saucer, an enchanting saga of Bethlehem's alleged encounters with a hot space babe known as Captain Aura Reigns. George Hunt and Will Williamson was very much in the style of Amsky. Yeah. Mm, very nice. Very interesting as well. Mm. Yeah, very much in the style of Amsky. Well, Ophirio Angelusi was granted flights on alien saucers and became a fixture of the UFO based lecture circuit. While there were certain differences between the various tales of the or the yarns that the Space Brothers told, there was one theme that really stood out. It was that it was the claim that many of the aliens came from Mars or had connections to Martians, regardless or, or whether or not one buys into this uh, into this often very tall tales of the contactees. It was an incredible influence of these immediately gifted storytellers that led to many, well, led many to look forward. Well, toward Mars for answers concerning the UFO presence on the, our world. Mm. Interesting. Very, very interesting, isn't it? Mm. What do you make of the stoked folks? Do you believe this stuff? And we'll be talking about Aura Reigns today. I've been I've been talking about I've been mentioning her in different videos and live streams. How she's a well, how she has aspects of the furry myth about her, how she's a beautiful woman of short stature that really reminds you of old tales of the fair folk from Eastern from, from Europe. Mm. And we'll be talking about that in today's video as well. Here we have this woman coming from another planet saying that she's an alien. Could she actually be a crypto terrestrial and is actually from Earth? But she's maybe some, maybe a member of a species of humans that are different from regular people who maybe possess abilities we don't or a technology we we can only imagine. And they live here on Earth, and it's why they want us not to make nuclear wars. They don't want a nuclear war because they live here on this planet as well. Or maybe they are that, but they also live on other planets. Maybe they are the first people on from Earth to basically colonize space, but they still live here on Earth and they'd rather not have us blow, blow it up. I mean, if, even if they live on other planets and they are human, at least partially human, maybe they're somehow evolved or something like that. Maybe they don't want us to blow ourselves up because we are still members of their, of their species. We are still human, even if there are differences. Or maybe they do live here and they, or maybe they do live out in space, but they still live, members of their race still live here on this planet. So they'd rather not have their home planet be blown up by a bunch of stupid humans, right? That could also be the truth. But do you think the aura reigns as a fairy, folks? We'll learn, talk about more about that as we read further. Hmm. But either way, let's go over here. Oh, we have two watching. Uh, sorry about the early about the morning stream, folks. As I said, I said I would do it in the morning today because uh, it's the weekend. I figured no one would care if I did that. I know I probably should do my my uh, supernatural stuff only at night because it's a lot, lot more mood setting. But hey, we're talking about. Or it rains the day, folks, the beautiful space captain from another world. So let's get back to this article, and we'll continue talking about the weird and the strange. Even certain elements of the U.S. military found itself infected by such stories in the summer of 1952. One commander, Randall Boyd, of U.S. Air Force Intelligence, quietly advised, well, New West Philcox, or yeah, N.W. Philcox, who at times was the FBI's liaison with the Air with the Air Force, that it's not entirely impossible that the objects cited may possibly be ships from another world, such as Mars. Truman Brithram was a Californian, Californian born in 1980, well, in 1998, who spent much of his early years working jobs that never seemed to last. His first marriage both began and crumbled during the Second World War. He entered into a second marriage only months after the war ended, and ultimately wound up working at the out in the hash hot, well, in the harsh hot deserts of Nevada, mm. specifically in the highway construction game. It was while Bethram was out in the desert in 1952, and while his second wife Mary was stuck at home in Santa Barbara, that Bethram claimed he had an extremely close encounter with extraterrestrials on on Mormon Mesa, or in a near 2,000 foot high, well, 2,000, 2,000 foot high, foot high, well, I should let me start again. A near 2,000 foot high, high mount in Nevada's Mopa Valley. Hmm. Okay, interesting. <coughs> <coughs> okay, and this was the first guy who encountered Captain Aura Reigns, the, the space captain, or a female space captain as it is. Now, as we talk further, folks, we have to ask ourselves, did this guy actually encounter aliens, or did he just imagine this? What I'm trying to say is, maybe he 
did encounter aliens, but they affected his personality, his perceptions, and he made them think that they were actually talking to him. It could very well be he hallucinated all of it. For all we know, he may be, this uh, bathroom here was uh, basically one of the first subjects to some sort of UFO disinformation campaign by the government. They drugged him and they made him think he was talking to aliens. It would also explain why he encountered these beings again, why they seem so different. Because in some of his, in Bethlehem's encounters with these aliens, when he was out in the desert, basically in their spaceship talking with them, as we will soon read, they were friendly. But in other times, these Captain Aura Reigns, when he saw her out in the town, literally as if she were on some sort of reconnaissance mission, she seemed different. She seemed meaner to him. It, now you could subject you could basically say in these encounters where he basically met her in, in his hometown and she was walking down the streets that she didn't want to talk to him because she was on a mission maybe some sort of a conscience missions for mission for her people if she was indeed an alien being and that's why she didn't want to talk to him which is rather mean to him in these encounters as we will read but in these encounters when in the desert when she when he was allowed onto the spaceship and was talking to Aura Reigns in person she was all but friendly saying that she was uh, 800 years old she was a grandmother and even though Bethram here tried to basically well work his magic on her because she was a very beautiful woman she had as, a, as she had said it was 800 years old and she had no interest in basically pursuing any more romantic rom romantic interests anymore but he would encounter Aura Reigns outside of these spaceships in his hometown, or at least in the in, in various towns. He, she would be walking down the street, and she'd be, be, be different, as we will read. She would be mean. She would not want to talk to him. Now, we could subject that we could basically ascribe this behavior to her being on some sort of reconnaissance mission or other mission. And she was very interested in basically studying Earth. And it might basically be bogged down with having to explain why she was there to a human. It could, we'll read that in a little bit, folks, and just give you an idea. Now, what is basically relevant to the fairy folk question, or to other alien things, other uh, or to the other, or to the alien question in general, is how that Aura Reigns was said to be about maybe four foot uh, eleven, or maybe five foot, a short woman, but maybe not abnormally short. She wasn't uh, like a, a dwarf, but she was very, but she was she and her uh, crew were on the short side of what it would be acceptable for humans and not basically be considered uh, basically dwarves or something, right? But this has all the earmarks of the fairy lore. In fairy lore, a lot of the times these humanoid beings will be either either maybe six feet tall or maybe two feet tall. And sometimes there's in, in between, we'll, we'll, we'll get in between such stature with these, or with these beings that look almost like humans, but have longer ears and are of short, short stature, maybe about five foot and, and act very weird. Here we have, or in these stories, we will be reading about Aura Reigns. Her behavior seems all nice when she's basically talking with Bertram on the ship, but her behavior outside of it is cold and distant, much in the way, same way that people in old, well, this as described the fairies in old fairy lore, or maybe vampires or other supernatural creatures in other lore, and like mermaids and stuff like that, as we will read. So her behavior could be ascribed to the fact that maybe she is human, or at least she looks human, and maybe is human, but certainly she might be more than human. Something else about her. Either way, she can be cold and indifferent to Bretham here when he encountered her later on, and other encounters of these strange beings have also mentioned them basically being cold and indifferent. But we will see that might not always be true. Could it be an act that she, when she was talking to Bretham on the ship that she was just trying to manipulate him? Perhaps. Maybe she was trying to warm up to his good nature, even though she didn't want to basically be get into any kind of a romantic relationship to him. She did want to basically have him on her good side for whatever reason. But another, as we will read, she had basically also at times, when she was encountered outside of the spaceship, her nature was completely different. Though, that could be to the fact that she was basically being pestered by this guy, guy who, by this guy who basically saw her, she was being pestered by Bethram and she was on a mission. Either way, folks, I'm just saying that how Aura Reigns and other of these uh, humanoid aliens act seems very seems incredibly similar to how people have described literal fairies from Lord of the Rings. Think of the think of the elves from the Lord of the Rings or other fairy stories or jinn. They're just they are basically described in much the same way: beautiful beings, the powers beyond our imagination. So it could very well be that the old legends of the fairy folk and other such things are based on aliens, or maybe the aliens are the same thing as these. Aliens and fairies are the same thing. So, either way, we have uh, Bethram here talking with, basically encountering Order Reigns for the first time in this uh, Mormon Mesa. Well, 
these are, yeah, on the Mormon Mesa. So let's get back to this article now. On the fateful night in question, and after the, wor the working day was over, Brethram climbed the mountain, primarily to search for sell shells, something that Mary particularly enjoyed collecting. The story goes that Brethram was rendered into a strange, altered state of mind, during which aliens from another world suddenly manifested before him. As I said, folks, could it very well be, as I mentioned earlier, that this, in fact, never, that this encounter never happened? He never, never met or a range. Maybe this was some sort of disinformation campaign by the government because it mentions that, his, that he felt like his state of mind had been altered. So maybe he was drugged. But let's read a bit more into it before we actually, we actually decide. Yeah. Either way, the story, yeah, was rendered into a, yeah, he was rendered into an altered state of mind during which aliens from another world suddenly manifested before him, having arrived in a huge gleaming flying saucer that quietly descended to the desert floor. Although only around Four foot five to five feet in height, the aliens were ir eerily human looking and claimed to come from a faraway planet called Clarion. Not only that, their leader was Captain Ora Rains, a shapely woman, and that the near salivating Berthram described as being tops and shapeless, shapely, shapeliness and beauty. All thoughts of Mary back in Santa Barbara were suddenly gone from Berthram's mind. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, here we have this there. Not all aliens are dwarfish creatures with black eyes. Yeah. And that basically is pretty much true there. Either way, let me go over here. We have five watching. Okay, thank you. Six watching. Seven watching. Good live stream right now, folks. Hope you're enjoying my live stream and this, this morning live stream. Either way, let's get back to this article. Bethroom's odd story continued and grew at a steady and controversial pace, as it did his relationship to the flirty Captain Reigns. For months, Bertram and Reigns had clandestine meetings, usually late at night, there they generally occurred in isolated desert locations in Nevada, where after Reigns' huge ship landed, the pair had long and deep conversations about the state of the earth, the Cold War, and the captain's homeworld, to which she promised to take Bertram one day. While Bertram did not ex explicitly say so, there are more than a few nuggets of data in Bertram's collective work that suggests on a couple of occasions the pair had just, had, had just about the closest and most imminent encounters of all. It's a hardly surprising. Yeah, but other people say that 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 that, that didn't actually happen. Bertram himself says that she didn't run up again to a relationship. That she she was eight hundred years old and was already a grandmother and was quite happy not to basically pursue any more romantic interests. But then again, we, this tidbit of information and the fact that maybe he did and Aura Reigns and him did do it is another thing we will will think on in a bit more as we read more of this article, folks. Because you got to understand, folks, in most in a lot of these UFO encounters. As with the gray aliens, these creatures do want to basically make, well, it's not just doing the naughty thing, folks. They want to make children. Could this also, could Aura Reigns have been wanting to make some sort of alien hybrid with this human man? Perhaps. But let's, uh, but as far as I understand it, we only have Bethram saying that she didn't want, want to do it with him. And other things that says maybe she didn't. We don't know exactly the real nature of this did happen, folks. I'm just saying that the, now the, the story of with Bethram and Ora Reigns might sound come off as a little out there and a little kooky. But the fact is, folks, that this guy was just an ordinary man. He had no interest in aliens or anything like that. But his tidbits and the well, the the facts in the story, the way this Ora Reigns acted and the way she encountered was very much like how the women in black behaved or other alien beings behave in many different UFO tales. And this was back in 1952, way before people were basically be reporting uh, Purim being abducted by gray aliens or other beings. So here we have a story that has many of the similarities of these stories with these alien beings basically wanting to make hybrids or other such things and being on the earth. But here we have this man who never heard of any of that. So that is a very strange bit of information, isn't it? Either way, the pair, yeah, the, we go past the part where, where that is and we get back to where we were. It's all hardly surprising then that many students of ufology outright dismissed Berthram's story as either a hoax or a fantasy born out of Berthram's unhappiness with both wife number one and two. Eventually, there would be a wife number three. There is, however, one particularly fascinating aspect of Berthram's acclaimed experiences that has a significant bearing upon the matter of the woman in black. <coughs> On two, yeah, on two occasions, Bertram said he encountered 
Ur reigns under circumstances very different to those which occurred out in the desert, with rains, huge flying saucer, and a crew of little men in view. These additional encounters saw reigns operating in what can only be termed disguised. Well, d termed disguise. In fact, in definitive women in black mode, there was nothing flirty or friendly about these close encounters. However, they were downright hostile. Well, hostile. They're, the first occurred around 3 o'clock a.m. in a time when a wealth of supernatural activity typically occurs. One August 1952 morning, Brethren and a close friend, Whitey, had just finished their shift and decided to head off in Whitley's pickup truck to a favorite all-night diner in Glen, Glendale, Nevada. White, Whitey was someone who Brethren had quietly confided in about his experiences with Aura Reigns. He was also someone who, although fascinated by Brethram's claims, was somewhat skeptical of the story. That is, until they entered the diner, and any skepticism White had was very soon to be wiped out. As the pair sat and drank coffee and ate pie, a uh, noticeably quiet whitey elbowed Brethram at the in, in the ribs and motioned him to take a look at the end of the counter. Brethram looked up and he was amazed and shocked to see Aura Reigns and an equally small male individual standing there. Yeah, this is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the few encou two encounters that Brethram had with Aura Reigns. Her behavior in this story here will be very different to how she was described earlier, with her being flighty and basically being nice in these, uh, basically, in those, uh, in those clandestine meetings in out in the desert at night. Here we have our very different Aura Reigns, but she's also very much very similar in one aspect we will soon read as well. <coughs> and not just and not just for the fact it was her. It, not just that she looked exactly like Aura Reigns that Bertha had encountered earlier. And not and she yeah, this was Aura Reigns as far as he was concerned. Because even though her behavior was different, you can you can basically subscribe it to the fact that maybe she was on some sort of mission, and that she was acting cold in these various encounters because she was basically on this said mission, whatever it was, and didn't want to basically be interfered with by some random guy, who basically just needed to basically say hello to her. Oh yes, the alien being who was on some sort of secret mission on Earth, basically should basically take time out of said s s secret mission to say hello to this one guy she met out in the desert basically drawing attention to herself and her companion, companion and their rather odd appearance. I mean, remember, they were about five foot here, here and stuff like folk, folks. So not exactly freakish, but her and her, her male friend were both very short and together. So you don't see too many short people together out in the, out in, out in the town in the middle of the night. And they basically had this very, very odd mannerisms as well. So yeah, they probably didn't want to basically draw too much attention to themselves. Okay, so there's that as well. Now, oh, we have four watching. Not too bad. Five watching. Six watching. Not too bad. So, where was I? Yeah, uh, yeah where was I? Yeah. Ah, here we are. He, Bethram looked up and he was amazed as he saw Aura Reigns and shocked to see Aura. Yeah, and shocked to see her in order and shocked to see or arrange and an equally small male individual standing there so let's, let's get back to the article here folks it's her isn't it asked whitey Bethram nodded pretty much in a state of near shock both men watched carefully as reigns and her colleague took seats at a window table in stark contrast to everyone else in the diner reigns was dressed in black well in a black black barrette wrap around well in a black barrette black wraparound sunglasses, and black velvet blouse and black boots. The only thing that wasn't black, a glaring red skirt, a worried whitey, asked, what are you going to do? Brethram knew exactly what he was going to do. He composed himself and walked over and talked to them. Whitey, however, was having none of it. He quickly exited the diner, preferring to sit in his truck in the overwhelming darkness of the desert rather than confront creatures from another world. Perhaps trying to be a gentleman and tactful at the same time. Bertram asked, I beg your pardon, lady, but haven't we met before? Hmm. Yeah, I guess he did. Hmm. Okay, we have eight people watching now. We're nine people. That's pretty good. Hmm. Uh, here we have basically Bertram finally basically conferring where it rains out in this diner. So let's get, should I basically think, ask what you guys think about this story? What do you think, as I said earlier, what do you think Aura Reigns is going to do here? Here, I think she's going to be happy to see Bertram out when when she is basically possibly doing something else. 
possibly on some sort of mission for government out or, or space for space people as it is certainly if you basically randomly encounter some guy you've met before and you're out on a job you don't really want to basically be interfered with especially if it's maybe as something as momentous as basically visitors from another world who are basically investigating earth so i can imagine or a reigns here probably isn't going to be very happy to see him as i mentioned earlier it's a interesting that fact but the her way her behavior is, as well as what she's dressed here, is rem remember, as I said earlier, here she's dressed as one of the women in black. She's wearing a black beret, black sunglasses, black blouse, but a red glowing skirt. So, but then, the, and that may be as it is, folks. But her outfit is pretty much completely like that as one of the women in black. So whatever Aura Reigns is, she might have a very, very weird connection to these so-called women in black, and maybe there are is more of an alien planet. And maybe there is more of an alien presence on Earth than anyone can, can basically really explain. Here we have this woman who possibly is an alien or a reigns. But here she is working literally as one of these so-called women in black, or at least she's dressed as one of them. For what reason, we do not know. Maybe she, the, maybe the part, of her, part of her mission on Earth is basically behave and basically make sure the mass... The, the public, the mass of the public doesn't realize that aliens are visiting Earth. So maybe she was working with the men in black as well. They basically hurdle uh, too much information getting out. I mean, she was talking to Bertram here, and he told his story, but that was fine. This may, this may have been basically under controlled circumstances. After all, she invited him on her ship, so if he basically told his thing, remember, he has no evidence that aliens actually visit him, only that he had basically encountered them out in the desert. So, under controlled circumstances, maybe these beings who basically go around scaring people and telling them not to talk about aliens, like the men in black or the women in black, maybe under certain, certain, certain circumstances, if they are under controlled certain situations, these alien beings don't care if humans know about them or basically talk about them. Because remember, Bethram here had no real evidence. He only had his word saying that he had met Aura Reigns. But here, as we shall, still, we shall soon see, her behavior is quite different, even indifferent and even threatening to Bethram because she had met him in an uncontrolled situation out in, an, out in this town, out in Nevada. So she can she had no control over the situation and she couldn't basically do anything like hold this guy against his will because she was in the middle of this town in this diner, in, in this situation. So she had no control over him, no control at all. She wasn't with her crew, so she was in a very precarious situation, especially if he basically started screaming that she was an alien being from outer space, right? So I can imagine she would not be in the best, she would not be in the best mood for seeing him in such a situation. Okay, let me go back over here. We have six watching. Ah, we have seven watching, eight watching there. Ah, that's pretty good. Either way, Bethroom had walked up to Aura Reigns. It was saying, have you met before? Here's where it gets good, folks. Reigns slowly, Reigns slowly looked up, glared at Bethroom with a wide-eyed and hostile stare. Yeah, wide-eyed because, oh, crap, it's Bethroom. Of all the people I meet out in the, on the planet Earth, I meet him right now, right here. Either way, she looked at him with a wide-eyed and hostile stare and uttered just one word, no. In private correspondence with fellow contacting George Hunt William Williamson, Bertram said that Rain's no was uttered in a chilling demonic tone, almost like a deadly hiss, because she was basically pissed. And the way she said it was probably because she was very angry at basically seeing her her friend in an uncontrolled situation. She had no control over it. So I did that. But then again, maybe she is a hostile, maybe, I mean, she, yeah, she was talking in an, in an uncontrolled situation. Either way, she basically said a no and an almost deadly hiss to use Bethram's own words. Bethram wasn't taking that for that for an answer. You very clearly resemble a lady I met some time ago out on Momen Mesa. The only response was another no of a very threatening style. Bethram evidently didn't get the message. Probably, and maybe she is, maybe Aura Reigns isn't a good person, folks. Maybe she is some sort of hostile alien being or or maybe demonic or uh, or other cryptozoological creature, maybe crypto-terrestrial creature, that is not basically has the best interests of mankind in her heart. But then again, it could very well be, as I said, folks, maybe she was basically on a mission she, didn't want to, she did not want to be bothered with. Either way, Bethram evidently didn't get the message. He blundered on with his line of questions. The answer was the same again and again. All the time, the weird little man with reins who, by the way, folks, will be described as basically five foot with pale skin and with a scar on his cheek. The scar on his cheek, by the way, is said by a waitress who was looking at him, said it looked like it was drawn on. 
literally like it look, looked like makeup. So clearly this creature, if it was human or maybe an, or a humanoid alien, was trying to look as normal as possible. Either way, we have Br we have uh, Brethram here. Evidently, didn't get the message. He blundered on with his line of questions. The answer was the same again and again at the time. The weird little man with reins, who also spotted dark sunglasses, said not even a single word. Brethram clearly recognized this odd behavior because this is how these alien beings acted. The males on the ship, on Aura Reigns' ship, who she captain captain. Yeah, she recognized this odd behavior, or rather non-behavior, on the part of Rain's comrade. The man did not give a hint that he either heard him he heard me or was even aware of my presence. He could have passed as a blind and deaf mute. As Bethram walked away and, and back to his table, the waitress came over. She just happened to be someone else that Bethram had told of this of his otherworldly experiences. She said to him, They are surely the saucer people you told us about. And she's the one who noticed that this this short man that was with Aura Reigns, he that he had a, he looked like the scar on his cheek had been drawn on with a pencil. That's what she said. Well, very interesting, no doubt, very very threatening, very out there as well, folks. Uh, here's the desert where apparently where Aura and Truman hung out at Giant Rock, California. Yeah. Other people who've seen aliens have seen these. Well, other people have seen these aliens and, and and talked to them. Have said they've basically seen them out at the giant rock in California. So here's another. Thing. This is the same general area as that as that as that place as that place is, folks. So yeah, for whatever reason, this area out in California in the Nevada desert attracts alien beings for some other for some odd reason. <coughs> Make that of what make of that what you will, folks. Hmm. I mean, honestly, what was the actual truth of this of these encounters? We will t continue to wonder about that as we uh, as we read further. But can you imagine, basically, if you were a human and you can't talk, and you met these alien beings? Sometimes they don't look human, like the gray aliens or the reptilians, but they look all too human in other encounters, like with with a uh, with a. Uh, with George Amsky's con with who contacted uh who made a, who who became a contactee as well as with Bertram here who basically talked with Aura Reigns. Whatever the truth is, all very interesting. I have to say, I keep using interesting, so maybe I should just say intriguing, out there, totally mind blowing. Yeah, can you imagine actually meeting these beings and they look human? They they say they're from another outer space and they look exactly like us. Maybe with some differences, but more or less like us. So very odd. But let's continue with the article now. He replied, I thought so. This is Bethram's, well, yeah, he replied to the waitress. No, he replied, I thought so too, but it may not be. The lady was has on dark, dark glasses. The man had a scar on his face. The waitress gave, yeah, the waitress gave a strange response. Yeah. I noticed that too, but it's not a scar. It is only penciled on. Hmm. Yeah. That doesn't mean that these alien beings wouldn't have scars, folks. But then again, I can imagine they would go to lengths to basically make themselves look more normal and human. Because remember, they're already about five foot even. That And they're both together. So that would draw a few eyebrows. Because why are these people so short? And why are they together? Are they family or something? And they were wearing outlandish clothes, completely black. At least Aura Reigns was wearing an almost completely black outfit, except for the red skirt she was wearing. She included the outfit included black boots, black barrette, and black sunglasses, and a black blouse, and re and a red skirt. So she didn't look exactly look completely normal. Her outfit just basically screamed a little out there, doesn't it? And her friend, her basically her coworker, or maybe her uh, subordinate who acted literally like he was a man again, or at least like he was in a daze or basically didn't speak and was just didn't care about anything that was going on. He was almost acting like he had, he, he, he almost acted like he was completely, he, he was completely non-human, didn't he? Like he was a robot. Here he didn't respond to anyone. He didn't notice anyone, but he, clearly maybe, maybe that could be due to training. Maybe he was some sort of military soldier, at least from his people, even though I'm not saying that this guy was a U.S. Soul agent or something. I'm saying that the, Aura Reigns' companion acted almost like he was a robot, or maybe it was the way his, his people act, like he was a, just a, like, a, like he was an automaton or, or something like that. And he basically only talked when talking to 
I mean, he only spoke, this alien being could only speak when he's spoken to. Maybe basically his, his orders are to basically not draw any attention and to back, act as aloof as possible and blend into the background as much as possible so no regular human can notice you. And this is why way Bethram has described these alien beings that, well, the other alien beings on Aura Reigns' ship, how they acted. They didn't talk. They didn't do anything else. They certainly didn't go out of their way to talk to him. Only Aura Maybe they are non-human beings, or maybe the maybe they are human or humanoid. But they are, the way they act and the way their society acts is different from ours. It could very well be they don't speak unless they're spoken to. Maybe that's what they want. Maybe they didn't feel the need to do anything to do. Maybe they didn't feel any other need to do anything else to make the human, especially because Aura Reigns was doing all she. Can. Uh, and their meetings down in the desert. So I guess these other alien beings just basically acted uh, normal. I don't know. We don't know exactly how they act in real, how they act in their daily lives. But clearly, Brethren mentioned that, mentioned that the crew on Order Ranger's ship basically were distant and basically didn't speak to him. And it basically did all they could to basically not to talk to him. Well, I guess not to talk to him. They may have said something like, say, yes or no. But they it clearly was almost like it was their nature not to basically do too much, like to act too friendly or or act too a human at, at best. Maybe because they were some sort of trained soldiers and they were basically there to make sure Bethroom and Aura Reigns had their time together. Maybe just to talk with him or may, dinner, maybe just to have, a, have relations with him to produce a child or maybe just to basically learn as much about humans as possible. Maybe that's why they need Aura Reigns to basically talk with him. But they themselves, the crew on Aura Reigns' ship, acted distant and basically acted very, very almost robot or insect-like, or maybe uh, at least very distant, at least uh, as if they weren't ordered to basically inter to interact with the bathroom. Maybe that's what they were. Maybe they were ordered not to interact with them because or only Aura Reigns had the authorization to interact with Bethram in any, in any way at all. Either way, the waitress mentions that the man looked like he had a scar on his, on his uh, cheek, on his face, but it was clearly penciled on. Hmm. Either way, let's continue. And that's what the wait waitress said. With that, the little odd man, yeah, the little odd man motioned for the check, yeah, for the check. In a few moments, it was paid, and the pair headed for the door. The waitress, wait, yeah, the the wait, Here's where it gets very interesting as well, folks. I mentioned that Aura Reigns did. This was probably the real Aura Reigns he met in this bar, in this uh, in this diner, and here we will here we will see why. The waitress raced over to breath room and said that the lady told me to tell you that she knows you and that she was very sorry and yes is the answer to some of your questions. As we can see here, she could have been, or Reigns here, could have been very busy and was only surprised to see Brethren there in the diner. I mean, it's very strange that she should encounter a strange man randomly out in the, out in, out in uh, Nevada and, or, or California, I would, let's just say Nevada, out in the middle of the night as, she was, as he was getting off of work. Okay, let me go back over here real quick before we continue. We have seven watching. That's pretty good. Eight watching. Nine watching. All right. All right. That's pretty damn good. Ah, but let's continue, folks. All right. It was then that something very strange happened, as Brethram noted. I saw them only a step from the door before I turned to pay my check. When I turned back, they were gone. I rushed outside, and there were and there stood Whitey, puffing nonchalantly on his cigarette. When I dumbfounded Brethram asked where the pair was, Whitey replied, they never came out. Honest, true, not a blessed soul passed through that door until you came out. Just a couple of weeks later, on a Saturday afternoon, Brethram was having his hair trimmed in a, on a, at a barber shop in Las Vegas when he caught sight of Aura Reigns. Yet again, this time she was walking along the sidewalk outside of the barbers, wearing her same outfit of black sunglasses, black barrette, black blouse, and red skirt. Brethram practically threw his dollars and coins at the astonished barber and raced back out the door. Lady, lady, cried Brethram as he caught sight of Reigns about 60 feet ahead of him. She quickly turned, looked directly at him, despite the fact that the street was crowded and the sh shout could have been come from any number of dozens of people on the sidewalk. And we, and now we understand why she's about to act like a jerk again to this guy. Yeah, he was out in the middle of the town screaming like a lunatic in the on a crowded street. And you would imagine why a, a possibly... A, an alien being who's on some sort of secret mission on Earth would not want to possibly be interact with this guy screaming at her. It would, probably because she was in the middle of a mission, right? 
Oh yes, perfectly. If 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 Aura Reigns was a regular human on some sort of uh, government business, she'd probably act the same way as well. For God's sakes, if she was a spy, you'd probably end up getting her killed. You stupid idiot. Ugh. Ugh. At least that's my opinion of Bertram here. I can understand why he would do it, folks, but I can also understand why Aura Reigns here acted so malevolent toward him, giving him a basically a very evil look. Because he was acting like a lunatic while she was on, basically, on the middle of the street where everyone who was probably eyeballing them. She was, she was probably already being eyeballed by, by thirsty guys already. I mean, she's she might be five foot, but she was apparently very well shapely and endowed and a very beautiful woman. So she was probably already having to fight off weird, weird assholes already. And then this guy, Bethram, basically comes screaming out of a barber shop trying to get her attention. Yeah, either way, it's an interesting story. Either way, let's get back to it. Does it, yeah, passing, yeah. It, yeah, the shout could have come from any number of pe dozens of people in the sidewalk. She slowly shook her head. The stone cold look, yeah. I imagine she did give him a look. Yeah, on her face was pure was one of pure evil. Bethram got the message as Reigns vanished into the crowd. Nevertheless, it wasn't long before the nighttime liaisons in the desert were renewed. Because he probably was, as I said, very busy at that point i can understand that folks at least that's what it looked like to me either way something something which continued until november 2nd 1952 when the little people of clarion finally said their goodbyes a crushed brethren was never see his beautiful woman from from the stars again maybe as we've seen that should be sometime that should be sometimes beautiful but other times nothing but hostile little people is a very appropriate appropriate term to use since there are clear and undeniable parallels between or or well yeah or reigns and the legendary female fairy folk who would enchant men in the middle ages era britain the sexual aspects of such encounters combined with notable amounts of missing time make them the centuries centuries old mirror images of today's alien abduction was Aura Reigns a 20th century yeah a 20th century equivalent of a fairy like elemental perhaps yes hmm. very interesting very very cool although the story of Truman Brethren most assuredly stretches credibility to the max yes and no but it has so many aspects of the fairy myth and, and alien myth that weren't weren't widely known back in 1952 folks which is why it was so strange Bethlehem was one of the first guys who contacted or arranged and basically had clandestine meetings with her and the way she acted seems very much like the later stories of the women in black either way as it, it's yeah it's important to note that it's filled with both wib and mib themed lore that simply was not in the public domain at the time in question. Namely, the early years of the 1950s and the 1960s, a curious trend began to, in which the MIB regularly turned up to intimidate people in restaurants and diners, just as Black Dressed Aura Reigns did way back in 19, August 1952. Well, 1952. The matter of Reigns on sunglasses, sunglasses, well, sunglasses, wearing comrade having a pointed while painted on scar mirrors the 1976 saga of dr herbert hopkins who's who's unsettling the mib seem, well who's unsettling mib seemed to be wearing lipstick and whose story plays a key role in the saga of the woman in black as well as, as will become apparent later on in this book other wib mib and mib are often just well are often described as wearing makeup as if to mask their milk white pasty skin. Then there's the matter of the disappearance of the strange duo as they exited the door of the diner. They vanished as in literally in no less than dozens of WIB and, M in and MIB cases. The black clad fiends of the night seem to possess the unnerving ability to dematerialize as they exit the homes of those they terrorize. Very interesting, I have to say. Very out there as well. So what do you make of Aura Reigns here, folks? I wanted to bring her up again and do an article about her because I've talked about her and basically talked about her before and how her story basically mirrors that of the WIB and the MIB. Is she basically one of the men in black or should I say the women in black here? Literally, she might be one of the first women in black ever encountered by anyone. Though these stories do go back decades, folks. And maybe even before that. So whoever Aura Reigns was, she seems like she was friendly but she seemed to basically have she seemed like she did have to do her job she, that she it was 
she was, for whatever reason, was doing something there. But she, for the most part, in most of these clandestine, in most of these meetings with Brethram, she seemed all nice and good. So, whatever the truth of the matter is, these alien beings do at times want to intimidate people and have them not basically interfere with them. And will do anything, including possibly even killing people or basically making them disappear to God knows where. Literally, they might not be dead, folks. They didn't just disappear and were killed. They might be disappeared and basically are now somewhere else. Literally, literally where no one human would, should be. Maybe on space or something. And basically, possibly, who knows? God knows what they're doing to them. But either way, these, these alien beings at times do, as I said, seem rather friendly. As Aura Reigns did, for the most part, act friendly towards Brethram here. Whatever the case, these stories are very interesting and certainly something to, something to basically meditate, meditate on and to wonder about and speculate on. But we're at the end of this video. We're at the end of this. We're at the end of this live stream, folks. So please go subscribe to my YouTube channel. Read comics. They're bad for you. Okay. The, there is misspelled. It's T H E R E. It's there, not there as it's supposed to be spelled. All right. If you want to see this stream again, use the link on the pinned tweet on my Twitter page at 777 megachris one We have 10 people watching. Ooh, we have 11 people watching when we have 12 people watching. Ah, another great live stream, folks. 13 people watching or 14 people. Yeah. All right. As I said, folks, make sure you're still subscribed. Leave some comments down below. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure to hit the part of the bell that will give you all future notifications. Share, and please share this video out. And please hit that like button for me. Also, folks, remember, please go over and subscribe to Creepy Little Book on YouTube and on Bitchute. Uh, Creepy Little Book is like the Art Bell radio show. He does short videos on high strangeness, but he also does live streams around 11 o'clock a.m. at night where he talks about ghosts, monsters, cryptids, all the weird things that go bump the night. All the weird things that go bump in the night. If you like Art Bell's old radio show or my show, then you're going to love Creepy Little Book. Go and subscribe to him on YouTube and on BitChute. Then go and subscribe to Robot Co-op. Robot Co-op is like Mystery Science Theater 3000. You know that old TV show? Yeah, that old TV show that roasts bad movies? Only Robot Co-op is a live streaming gaming channel. You're going to love their horror game live streams on Twitch on Sunday, on Sunday folks, because they're just fun. Now, they use these robot. They use these robot puppets in their live streams, and they play video games. They ra they rag on the games they're playing and have a great time. It's like being at a party. So go and subscribe to Robot Co-op on YouTube and on Twitch. I also want you to go over and subscribe to Stitched Together Picks on YouTube. Stitched Together Picks is a horror movie review channel hosted by the Maniacal Cinephile. The Maniacal Cinephile, yeah. The Maniacal Cinephile has multiple personalities. So you're not just getting one character. You're getting a whole lot of them. All of them are fun. So go and subscribe to Stitched Together Picks on YouTube. Remember, folks, down in the descriptions, as well as in the chat, there are links to YouTube, Twitter, Rumble, Aussie, Twitch, and BitChute. Remember, folks, I upload exclusive videos to Rumble, Aussie, Twitch, and BitChute that I upload every day. In fact, I'll be uploading these videos soon, as soon as this live stream is done. So make sure to basically use those links and go to subscribe to me on, YouTube, on Rumble, Odyssey, Twitch, and BitChute. I'm Chris Williams from the Scum Dogs Kennel, folks. Thank you all for joining me. I'll be back again tomorrow with another great live stream. So be sure to come back again then. Till next time, folks, I will see you all again soon.